Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. A great conversation coming out of our connection groups on Sunday morning at 9 called Sunday School. And love for you to participate. If you are a guest with us, we invite you back for that time, uh, connecting with our family a little more personal level. Uh, we are delighted that you are here now for our what we call corporate worship time. As we all come together, uh, we are here to, to worship. Uh, worship is to acknowledge who Jesus Christ is. We are here to grow and to grow in that knowledge and to, to learn and develop and um, begin to find how I can serve, worship, grow, serve. Those are the three things we want to do. It's on the front of your bulletin, so if you have one of those, keep that handy with you. Throughout the service, we'll, uh, we'll talk about what's on the inside at the, at the end of it. During the message, is on the back there, and you can uh, begin to, if you're one of those that needs to write things down, it kind of keeps you alert, uh, feel free to utilize those as well. We do the best we can to make sure that they are uh, spelled correctly, but sometimes I put some teasers in there. They're just mishaps. Sometimes I misspell them. Uh, but anyway, like last week, anybody recognize the misspelled word on the, on the, on the, on the screen? Samson. Samson. There's no P in Samson. <laughs> I don't know. But some people do. The Bible doesn't. But anyway, um, that was just a mishap. But we have those every once in a while. Uh, but we are glad you are here today. Uh, there is so much about Thanksgiving left in the Word of God. We're going to take it one more week. Uh, next week we'll start our Christmas themes. Uh, we're going to be in Psalms chapter 107. If you want to go ahead and mark that in your Bible, that way when we get to the message time, we can jump right in uh, to that wonderful passage uh, that says that we are to be thankful for God and all of his loving kindness. It repeats it three or four times within that text. And so we'll be looking at that uh, during our message time, Psalms chapter 107. And so we'll invite you to get involved in the Word of God, opening it up and looking at it and, and learning from it, and we get to experience God's Word. When we open up the Word of God, I want you to know it's as if it's fresh ink on a page. It's God writing it still to us in our hearts. And, and although we may not fully be able to experience all of the same things that the psalmist was experiencing as in historical events that uh, pertain to him, we still have the same message and the same God writing it to us, and we can identify with how God provided for him, he's going to provide for us. And that's that fresh ink on a page. God is writing on our hearts his word and taking care of us. So we have every reason to be thankful. Uh, verse 1 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Verse 2 says, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Okay, we are the redeemed. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the redeemed. And let the redeemed say so. In other words, let the redeemed be the one who becomes the choir, becomes the resounding, the resounding sound that says, give thanks to the Lord. So you're the redeemed, and we're going to join together as Randy and our praise team leads us in a time of saying so. We're going to give God praise today, and we're thankful for all that he has done for us and what he will do. So will you stand with me? You are the redeemed. Stand with us today to have a word of prayer. Father, we come before you today. We say thank you for all that you are doing. And Father, we, we ask that you would just speak to our hearts um, and, and show us the things that you've done that we have just plumb forgotten about. And maybe today we'll say thank you today. We'll give, your, give our hearts to you and we will give that, uh, uh, that, that great sound as a church body saying, yes, thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Randy, lead us today.
seated. Children can be dismissed to children's church at this time. Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much for today and thank you for all you do in our lives. All the blessings that you bestow upon us, all the, all the gifts that you give us. Father, I just pray that during this season that we, um, that we look to you first and foremost. Father, that all the hustle and bustle doesn't get us down. Father, I pray that, that just as the season comes along that, that we look, look to your, your son, your savior, our savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, just uh, I pray that you just work through each one of us during this time. And Father, just uh, let us be the shining light that we need to be. And Father, just pray that you, uh, you bless this gift we're about to receive. And I ask you to bless those who are giving. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble said. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, God, for trusting me to be his dad. Thank you, Lord, that when a door closes, you're still going to take care of me. And thank you for cheetahs and pickles and failings, and mommies, and daddy. <laughs> Thank you, Father, <laughs> for always giving me perspective. I'm so sorry. Thank you, God, that you are the great physician of both my body and my soul. Father, thank you for knowing my family's needs even before I do. And for ladybugs and old people and Disney movies and Miss Walker and Don't. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me that I'm never alone. Thank you, God, for what I have. And also, I wouldn't mind an upgrade soon. Thank you, Father God, for love, joy, peace, and patience. Lord, especially patience. And thank you for Jesse, even though he's mean during recess. Help him find a good friend. That's what he needs. I love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you, God, for childlike faith.
If you have your Bibles, once again, turn to the passage in Psalms chapter 107, and we'll take our time uh, this morning to look at this passage, and it g- gives us the understanding that God is unfailing love. And as we think about all the things that we could be thankful for, I want you to mark this one up uh, a little higher on your list of giving God thanks, giving him thanks for his unfailing love. Love. There are so many things that our world is always changing and, and it's always uh, moving. It's never constant and it's hard to, to really even uh, settle in on things because of the ever-changing pace that we're in. Uh, but yet God says that he is unfailing. It never changes. It's the one thing in your life that can be constant and you can rest assured he'll always be there. Psalms 107 celebrates primarily, once again, going back to Egypt. You have to go back to that time of the Exodus experience. And and there is so much in the Exodus experience uh, that you see will drive the nation of Israel in their understanding of who God is. We can never fully understand all that took place going from Egypt in the wilderness experience, back into the promised land. We'll never fully grasp it, and yet David continues to write over and over and over again of what they experienced in that event is driving him in his faith in that moment that you and I, as this is ink, uh, fresh ink on that page, that drives us today that that which God did for Israel during that wilderness experience, God wants to do for us today. And we see that time and time again. But then there, we're going to look at a passage in this, in this chapter uh, that it doesn't really fit the wilderness experience. And there's something else that David has seen in his life and has seen God do that he puts in here. And in those what we call unknown events, we don't know what was happening in David's life. We don't know exactly the event that was taking place. But what we do know is the biblical principle is there whether we don't, whether we know the event or we don't know. And he's going to relate to us and we'll see as we get through this passage that we can then apply the same lessons as David is applying in his life to us today. Psalms 107. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His loving kindness is everlasting. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the adversary and gathered from the the lands, uh, from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south. It gives us this introduction uh, to give God praise uh, that his love uh, lasts forever. His love endures and his love extends far beyond the borders of what Israel, oftentimes Israel was uh, guilty of restricting God to their borders, their physical boundaries. And, and here is the boundaries. You got the Jordan River over here, you got the Mediterranean over here, and you've got a desert in the south, and you have the, the uplands in the north, and, and there were certain boundary lines. And, and Israel would say, if, if we leave these, this land, uh, will God protect us? And, and here David is saying that God gathers us from the north, the south, the east, and the west, and, and that God is everywhere. His, his loving kindness is far beyond the borders. Orders. Never put God in that box and say God's love is just here. God's love breaks our borders and expand. His love is everywhere. Uh, love in our world lasts for a season. It lasts for a moment. It has conditions on it. But God's love is unconditional. And, and God's love reveals that uh, nothing will separate us from the love of Christ and uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 35 says, What will separate us, or who will separate us from the love of Christ? Tribulation, distress, persecutions, famine. Uh, and it goes on, it's a big list of things. He said, Nothing, nothing separates us from God's love. Uh, we begin to see the, the, the importance of God's unfailing love. And as you look through the Psalms, we'll see four, four pictures. And as we take a look at the first one in verses four through nine, it really takes us back to that wilderness experience and talking about they wandered in the wilderness, the desert region. They did not find uh, a way to an inhabited city or a place to settle. They couldn't find 
find anything. And on the journey, they were hungry, they were thirsty, their, their soul fainted within them. And they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distress. And then he led them also by a straight way to go to an inhabited city, a, a place where they could call their home. Um, and he says in verse 8, let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. We begin to see that, that God's love does not fail to replenish us, to, to provide for us. Uh, they were on the verge of perishing. They, they felt as if God brought them to the, the wilderness experience. It took them out of Egypt. And, and they kept saying, let's go back to Egypt. Let's go back there because we were safe there. We were secure because Egypt army would protect us and they would provide for us and they would take care of us. Let's go back to Egypt. And oftentimes we do the very same thing. We want to go back to the bondage that we were in and realizing that there, that really wasn't a good time. But yet in the wilderness moment when you fully have to trust God, you fully have to, to trust God to feed, to water, you fully have to trust God with everything, we want to run back to where there's comfort. And God says, trust me, I want to bring you through this land of Egypt. And they, he put them on, on that barrier of that Red Sea. He had a way for them. He brought them through and he provided for them. He took care of them. He gave them uh, bread when there was no bread called manna that lasted the entire time they were in the wilderness. He gave them meat. They cried for meat. He gave them the quail. He provided for them the entire time they were in the desert. He gave them a promised land. He said, I'm going to take you back to the land that I promised Abraham. You go back to Genesis chapter 12 and you, you begin to see the promise that was there. This land, of, uh, the land flowing with milk and honey and it would provide for the nation. And Israel today uh, provides for the nation. It provides for the world, but yet it is, it is as small as Rhode Island. Uh, yet God said, I will give you this land and it will provide for you. They're in the wilderness experience, Numbers chapter 13, and they begin to look at the, the promised land. They send their spies out there to, to check out and say, we don't, not for sure if God really knows what it looks like, so we're going to send our spies in there. You know how we are. I want to just kind of make sure it's, it, it's okay before we take our step of faith. And they get there, and they're exactly right. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It has everything they could ever dream of. Uh, the, the fruit is huge, and everything is just great. It's plentiful, except for there's giants in their land. There's these big giants, and, and they come back and say, it's great, except for there's people already there, and they're huge. It's a grasshopper complex because they said, but we look like grasshoppers in their sight. They will just chew us up and spit us out. That's the way we, we, we treat God. God said, let us be thankful because he's going to provide for us the land full of milk and honey. And he is also going to provide for us a way to get it. He's going to take care of us. But we oftentimes, we want to shy away. We want to back away. And David is being reminded how God took care of them. He had a plan for them. And God did exactly as he promised. The problem was they weren't very thankful. And David says, sometimes we're not thankful enough for the, what God has provided, how he has taken care of us. We just look ahead and say, I don't think it's going to work out. He's brought me to this place, but yet there's a Red Sea, there's a wilderness, and we're going to die there. And then you take us to this land, and we, yeah, it, it, it's plentiful, but there's people already there, and there's no way that we can have it. And, and God, you said you'd give it to me. I don't understand. And so what they do? They stayed in the wilderness and say, God, we'll just stay here. God said, fine, you can wander in the wilderness for another 40 years until the new generation would step up in faith and begin to go into the promised land. You can write your notes. You can write the book of Matthew, chapter 6. Jesus is dealing with the very same issues of his day. He's talking on the Sermon on the Mount and sitting on that mountainside. And he's beginning to teach them. And he knows exactly how they are because we haven't changed from the Israel. You and I haven't changed. We're, we're, the, we're, we're the same mentality. We're always worried that God will not provide, that God will not take care of us. Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor, nor for your body as what you shall put on. 
is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says, look at the birds of the air. They don't sow, they don't reap, but yet they're full. I provide for them. I take care of them. Are you not much, are you not worth more than they are? And he said, take a look at the lilies of the field. Do I not clothe them? Do I not take care of them? We've got to trust God. Here's this closing of this great sermon. He's saying, hey, all of the anxiety that you bring upon yourself, let it go and let me guide you. Let me clothe you. Let me feed you. Let me provide for you. Be thankful that I'll take care of you. Verse 33 is that great verse. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of, kingdom of God, of his righteousness. Seek him first. Look to him. And he said, I'll take care of everything else. We have a tendency to want to take care of ourselves and then seek God. When I take care of myself, when I have reached where I need to be, and then I'll seek God. God says, no, you've got it wrong. You've got to flip it. You've got to seek me first, and, provide, and I'll provide for you. We understand that God's unfailing love will always replenish us. He'll always take care of us. I know it's football season, but uh, baseball season is just a few months away. Um, spring training happens in April, and so you might as well get ready for it and set aside that, that other sport that there is out there with helmets and pads and everything else. Um, one thing that I've learned, and now Braden's played a lot of baseball. Some of you have played a lot, too. Uh, Braden, let me ask you a couple questions. I'm going to put you on the spot, okay? you played baseball. you played collegiate level. Is um, the way to score, you have to go to first base first, correct? And then go to second, then go to third, then go to home. I, I can't shortcut it. Can't run to third and then run back. Okay. Foul lines are the same. Anything outside is a foul inside, whether it's peewee or college, right? Home plate's the same dimensions. Does it expand? Technically, no. <laughs> that plate is the same. Okay. So there's only one way you're going to score in baseball. You've got to go to first base first. You know, then you go to second, then you go to third, and you, you run home. Matthew 6.33 is based on that very same principle. I should say baseball is based on that principle. <laughs> You got to seek God first, and He'll take care of the rest. You've got to go to home plate. You've got to start at home plate, and then God allows you then to trust Him and says, Now you trust me, and you go to first base, and I'll take care of you. You learn about me first, and then you can learn about second base, and then you can learn about third base. But if you don't go to first base, which is developing the character of God, those other two bases are insignificant. They mean absolutely nothing. And if you try to go to second base, I'll just, I don't want to go, I'll just run over the pitcher, and I'll run right to second base, you'll be called out every time. And you can't run them in reverse. I know we laugh at, the, at those peewee kids that, that they hit the ball and they run to third, and then they go to second, they, they try to run it in reverse. We laugh and say that's funny, but if a major league ball player did that, see ya. Hit the showers. But oftentimes we do that with God. We don't trust God to replenish us, to take care of us. God's unfailing love will always provide for us. Be thankful for his provisions and trust him and, and do what he's asked us to do. Step out in faith and trust him. David is telling us that in Psalms 107. But he goes on and talks about God's unfailing love also releases us, verses 10 through 16. He goes on, he says... Uh, there were those who dwelt in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in misery and chains, because they had rebelled against the words of God and, and spurred the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he humbled their heart with labor. They stumbled, and there was none to help. Verse 13, here it is. And then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of their darkness and out of the shadow of death, and he broke, their band, he broke the bands apart. Verse 15 is the same as verse 8. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness, for his wonders to the sons of men. We begin to see that God will release us 
understand that we put ourselves in chains. We put ourselves in bondage. We put ourselves in captivity. We do that. Why? We reject God's counsel. We go against what God says. When we reject God's counsel, we strike out, if it would. We don't make it to first base. We reject what he has to say. Every year in high school baseball, our coach would, at the end of the season, give us a fine. Every time we missed a sign, it cost us. And at the end of every game, he would say, okay, Callum, you, you owe us a dollar. I was probably the, the highest paid player there. I paid everybody. Uh, for missing a sign, if he, made, he gave the bunt sign and you didn't bunt, it cost you money. Now, at the end of the year, we, he used that money to provide the barbecue. But uh, anyway, um, you know, I was thankful I could provide for the team. Um, but I put myself in that bondage. I missed the sign. I remember one time I was on first base and he gave me the sign to steal. And I knew I couldn't outrun. I knew I couldn't do it. So I didn't do it. I got chewed out on the bus ride home. I did. I got chewed out. And I, he asked me the reason. Why didn't you do it? Did you miss the sign? I said, no, I just knew I couldn't make it. He said, that's not up to you to make that decision. He says, you are to obey me. You are to follow the sign that I give you. There was a reason I wanted you to do that. And you failed. God, God will allow us to make mistakes. But I want you to realize the bondage that we put ourselves in is, is, is what we do. We are doing it. We're rejecting the counsel of God. We're saying, God, it's irrelevant. I can't trust you. And, and therefore, I'm going to stay where I'm at. And he said, it is bondage. It is captivity. We lock ourselves in to this world of just making it by, of just trying to survive, making it to the very next day, instead of allowing God uh, to, to work in our lives, allowing him to break open the Change, allow him to break the bars down. Let's trust him. Allow God to release us. And notice what verse 13 says. And then they cried out. See, they rejected God. And what happened is, is, is that, that the bonds came around them. The chains came and surrounded them. And it broke their heart. They, they stumbled and there was nobody to help them. But they finally realized it was God. God, you are my hope. You are my rescue. God, you release me. You look at this passage, and you probably go back to the time of Judges we looked at last week with Samson. And in that time, that, that cycle, they were doing things in their own way, their own eyes, and not allowing God to have total control. They would for a time. And there would be great peace for 20 to 30 years. And then they would reject God, they'd walk away from him, and then they would be oppressed, and then they would be put in bondage and slavery. They'd cry out to God, God, to God again, and God would send them a judge, he'd send them someone to a physical representation, a, a vessel of honor, and they would then follow, and God would rescue, God would release, and they would enjoy prosperity once again. They would enjoy living in the righteousness of God. But there was this cycle, and David is recognizing, and he says, we do the very same thing. We get caught up, we reject God, we get Get in our bonds. Let God's love release you. But stay in that state. Don't go back. Don't revert back. This picture of, of God uh, rescuing them, God taking care of them. I want you to see the picture in that, that God didn't write them off. God stayed right with them. He knew what they were going through. And yes, he allowed them to go into those times of bondage. He goes into those times of captivity. He allowed it so they would, what, learn. So they would wake up and cry out to God. They would cry out to him that he would, what, he would rescue them. He would, he would release them. God will release you from the bondage of sin. Catch this. Whenever you're ready. Whenever you're ready. He puts some responsibility upon us to cry out to him. Now, we, we can't do it on our own. We can't release ourselves. Well, we can try all the 12-step programs you want, but you can't release yourself from the bondage of sin. But he can. And when you cry out to him, Notice that. You'll see that in uh, several passages, in several verses here. When they cried out to God, God took care of them. 
So the, the question this morning as we're dealing with thanksgiving is, when are we going to get to that point of being thankful for God and cry out to him? And, and truly say, yeah, I'm going to seek you first. And I'm going to seek your righteousness above all things. I, I'm going to seek you. I'm going I'm to strive for you. And I'm going to let you, God, then take care of the rest. Let him release you. And he'll never say, I told you so, when you cry out to him. Oftentimes we, we wonder, well, God's going to, you know, I told you so. I, you know, yeah, you, you're going to get that from yourself because yourself is going to say, yeah, I guess I should learn the lesson. But God just stands there with his arms open wide and says, come home. Come to me. I'll take care of you. His unfailing love, it, it, it does not fail to replenish us or, restore, or release us. In verses 17 through 22 is to restore us. In verses 17 through 22, he says, Fools, because of their rebellious way and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Verse 17 tells us something about our hearts. Is that, that our, our own health is at stake when we sin. There is not only is there bondage as in a, a lifestyle of sin that we get locked in. But there's also a health issue that sin can cause as well. He says, I want you to know that your health is at risk. When you sin against me, you walk against me. He says, it can cause physical illnesses. And, and God says, it, it all comes because of the guilt, the anxiety, the weight of life causes this, our bodies, our systems to break down. And as we take a look at this, God says that out of your foolish heart, you're allowing the iniquities to affect your life. Now, I want to make this statement clear as well. Just because you're sick doesn't mean you're in sin. Our bodies do get sick without sin. They naturally break down. So we need to understand the difference. Job went through that, and his great friend said, well, Job, you're going through this because you're just a sinner. You're just, you know, you're walking away from God. And, and Job says, no, I'm going through this for, for, for a reason, and God will bring us through this. That's a short version of the book of Job. But here David is acknowledging that there are times when our, our bodies do break down and get sick because of sin. And the, and the only way you're going to be healed out of that is from God's healing hand. God will restore. L look at that. How, how God will, will lift us up when they, in verse 19, what? They cried out to God. They cried out in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He sent his word, and he healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his loving kindness and for his wonders to the sons of men. David is just amazed at how God will restore our health. He will restore our lives. He will, he will replenish us he will release us when we cry out to him but verse 18 is an interesting verse it's going back to the time of, of the wilderness experience and it talks about of hoarding all kinds of food and they were drawing near to the gates of death the indication of that verse is they got tired of God's manna they got tired of the quail. They wanted something else. They got tired of asking God to, to supply water in the desert. They, they, they got tired of always having to go to God. And so they were wanting to walk away from God. They were rebelling. And there was sickness throughout the Israelites. All because they were rejecting God. But when they cried out to God, he took care of them. God will, God will bring us healing. He cleanses us from sin. In 1 John 1, 7 says, But if we walk in the light, he is in the light. And we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. When we walk, what? With fellowship. With him. Fellowship with one another. We, want, we need each other. I hear this all the time. I don't need to go to church. I can be a Christian just fine without the church. Yes, the church doesn't save you. Jesus does. 
The church pro- provides the fellowship. You need fellowship. You need Christian fellowship. You need to be with those who are looking at the Word of God. You need to be with those who are, are exercising the Word of God. You, you need love and care of the body of Christ. And so as we are walking in Him, He will provide you with the right influences in your life to guide and direct you, to keep you on that straight path so you don't walk away from Him. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus is in the synagogue, and, and it's it, it, probably one of my favorite passages, and He picks up the scroll. The scroll is handed to Him. It's Isaiah, and, and He unfolds it, and He begins to read, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim the release of the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. This is the year of Jubilee. This is a time to restore. Jesus, I have come to restore. I've come to turn it back over to the way it originally was. At the cross, he died. At the tomb, he was resurrected. He walked out of there to what? To give you the opportunity to be what? Restored. By what? Being born again, we call that. By by, by repenting and allowing God's Spirit to fill you. You are what? A new person. You are restored. So we can rejoice, we can sing, and, and we can shout hallelujah. Because his love never fails. Verses 20, uh, 23 through 31 talk about that God's love does not fail to rescue us. Now, here's a situation that doesn't really reflect the time of, of the wilderness experience. There's another situation he brings into mind uh, that fits perfectly that God takes care of us. And when, when it is in a, a strange situation, have you ever been in a storm? Have you been on a, on a lake and the, the waves got higher? You've been in that, that storm in a boat and, and you get scared. I've been there with my grandfather in Lake Mille Lacs in, in, in Minnesota. and uh, We were out fishing, and the storm just came upon us quick. I was scared. Lightning, I mean, it just started to pour. I mean, just it just came down on us. and I was scared to death. Couldn't do anything at that time. Another time I was down in the bayou in Louisiana, a storm came upon us. Ken Cooper, was, he was teaching me to fish in South Louisiana, next to the alligators and uh, a storm came upon us and, and of course if you ever fish in the bayous there is no direction at all it's just swamp lands and he is he's in a big old bass boat and it's just it's just it's just flying the and he's just flying through and we finally get to the dock and it's storming it's lightning and it's just miserable and he says you have two choices you either jump out and get the, get the van and back the trailer in, or you stay with the boat, and you'll drive it on real quick, and I'll pull us out until we find some place safe, and then we'll, we'll lock it all down. I said, you don't have a third choice? <laughs> I can't back up a trailer to save my life, especially in a storm. And you're trusting me with this multi-million dollar boat to just circle around in the storm, and it's just crashing in. You want me to do this? He said, those are the only two choices. What are you going to do? I said, I'll stay in the boat. There are times when the storms come and God uses the storms to teach us about himself. It's in those storms that that he talks about that the waves are are crashing in. It's the sailor who's out there and the the storm just comes and and it's a storm all about God. The book of Jonah is all about God. It's a God-sized storm for a God-sized purpose to bring God's man to where he needs to be. Sometimes the storms that we're facing, God is allowing to come our way to get our attention, to get us to the point where we're going to cry out to God, say, God, I'm sorry. It's Jonah saying, I'm the one. I'm causing the storm. Now throw me overboard and God will take care of you. He'll take care of me. I'm going to put my hands in God. Throw me overboard. I think I would have asked for a choice three, wouldn't you? God, is there another way out of this storm? But Jonah knew to push me overboard, and God provided safety through the belly of a whale. God is amazing God, how he takes care of us. It was in that belly of the whale that he learned to repent and get right with God. Storms are that way. 
And God allows them to, to get our attention. Other storms are totally not about you, and they're just the waves of we live in this world, and you get caught in a storm. And you're there to teach somebody else about God. So God's using that storm in somebody else's life, and he puts you in the midst of that storm, and it's all to teach somebody else about God. David said, let, let, let's be thankful that God rescues us. God takes care of us in the midst of the storm. Verse 31, once again, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men, to, to the wonder, to to." to each of us. God works wonders, and he wants to open us up to those wonderful things, those wonderful acts of God. And it's in the midst of all of those acts that God always provides us with an opportunity to give him praise. So David is taking the opportunity to give praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So we ought to lead the way in being thankful. For how God does replenish us. He does provide for us. And I know we could probably, each of us, put one thing on the list. But one, you know, how God provided me this past month. God provided in ways that I didn't know was coming. And yet God provided. How God releases us from bondage. How you were trapped in sin and God has released you. How you were uh, trapped in your, your own sin. It was causing even some internal conflict within your own life and stress and sickness. How God, what well, he restored you back to health. How God restores. How God rescued from a storm. The storms of life and yet God took care of you. It's all very simple. God says you've got to go to first base. You've got to trust me. I'll help you with your relational issues at second base. I'll help you with your career choices or your, 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 your uh, other ways of, of living. I'll, I'll take care of those things. And then you arrive back at home plate and you scored because you, you became a kingdom person. Because through those relationships, you began to understand how God wants to use you in restoring others and, and reaching out to others and showing them love. And, and then God teaches how he's going to provide for you. But it's not just for you alone. It's to provide for his kingdom. That God has gifted you for a reason. God gifted David for a reason. For what? To rejoice and to teach us about praise. And you score the home run when you give God praise in everything. And you help others Start the process over. Let's give God praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. In a world of uncertainty, there's one thing that you can always trust. is God's unfailing love. So we invite you to come with a thankful heart. To cry in a cry of dependence. God, I need you. I need to be filled with your unfailing love. I, I come to him with a thankful heart saying, God, thank you. And, and I'm sorry that I have been selfish and think, look at all the things that I have done. When God, you did it. I take no credit. I give you thanks. Let's pray. Father, I'm so thankful for David and how he uh, guides us in praise today. And he calls us to remember how you've taken care of us as he continues to look back at, their own, at his own history and he sees your unfailing love. May we recognize your unfailing love in our lives today and may we say so. May we write this Psalms with a personal, uh, with a personal proclamation of how you have replenished us, you've rescued us, you've restored us. Father, may we write this today. May we celebrate with a thankful heart and cry out to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing, all who are thirsty, come.